we're not quite there, but there we are, 530. Welcome to our meeting, our ordinary council meeting of Monday, the 19th of August. And we will start with our traditional and very serious welcome to country. We, we the Bangla people, welcome you to our country. We are the lawful inhabitants of this peninsula for thousands of generations. We are part of this land on which we stand, part of the waters that flow in and around. We are part of the dreaming stories that are connected. The full awareness of oneness with the land and waters will ensure a future for the children of tomorrow. Gaya Punaguru Bangala Miranya, Yura Damilbu. Thank you. Thank you all. Our oath to Waiala. We, the Waiala Council members, commit to serving the community of which we are a part and will work together diligently and collaboratively to create a prosperous future in which we all can share. There will be obituary notices. I ask those that wish to to stand, please, and then a moment's silence. <coughs> Raymond Powell, Heather Aidy, Trevor Manley, Ronald Harding, Claudia Talbot, Sophia Dutch, Lorna Anderson, Robert Gray, Kenneth Butson, Geraldine Holzman, Lorraine Burns, Tom Wilson, and Valerie Hockey. Thank you. Item four, our attendance record. We have an apology from Councillor Westerman. There are no leave of absences. Item five, council member or executive declarations. 5.1, conflicts of interest. Does anybody have a conflict of interest they need to declare? I do. Councillor. Um, from the Wild Foot Girls Football League and the Cricket Association. Um, so I'll leave the chamber while that takes place. Thank you, Councillor. Oh, what is the nature of the conflict? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. No further conflicts. 5.2 gifts and benefits. Does anybody have a gift or benefit they need to declare? We're straight on then. Item six, minutes of the previous meeting, 6.1. Yes, confirmation of the minutes of the previous ordinary council meeting held on Monday, 15th of July, CEO. Thank you, Mayor. Just wanted to um, bring to councillors' attention that Councillor Knox um, identified uh, an anomaly with our minutes from the last meeting. Um, councillors can only speak to an item once um, as per the local government um, standing meeting procedures. Uh, but when we were discussing the item of Australia Day, uh, there were uh, some councillors that uh, spoke more than one occasion. So the minutes accurately reflect um, what was discussed and who moved and seconded the, the various motions um, at the last meeting. Um, but just acknowledge that um, administratively we need to ensure that we um, comply with the meeting procedures. So we'll be um, paying more attention to that tonight. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, CEO. If I, if I may add, sorry, one extra thing. Um, fortunately, um, just adding to that last comment, that, that item, um, despite that 
uh, administrative uh, anomaly um, is back before council tonight. So it wasn't that um, the meeting procedures led to a decision at the last meeting uh, that would require a revision, sorry, a rescission motion um, to correct. Um, so that matter will be reconsidered tonight as part of tonight's agenda. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Would somebody care to move the recommendation? Moved Councillor Simpson, seconded Councillor Campbell. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Can I raise a point of order? Is Councillor Campbell able? Oh, sorry, she's here. I thought you were, I, I looked at the screen. I thought it's all this luxury apartment. Oh. So. <laughs> No, thank you, Councillor. I had seen her on the screen and I had seen her in person. <laughs> thank you. Item 6.2, confirmation of the minutes of the special council meeting held on Monday, 29th of July. Will somebody care to move the recommendation, Councillor Knox? Yes. And second, Deputy Mayor Pond. Yes. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Item 6.3, confirmation of the minutes of the special council meeting held on Monday, the 12th of August. There is a recommendation there. Councillor Knox, I think, was on top. And now, Council, you're moving it. Yep. Councillor Border seconding it. Yes. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Item 7, matters adjourned or laid on the table. There are nil. Item 8, deputations. We have two deputations, 8.1, Mr Scott Leverington and Mr Riley Sanders from the Wyla Women's Football League. Gentlemen, if you would like to come up near the dais. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Storm. Um, yeah, so firstly, I'd like to thank the Wyla City Council for taking this, giving us the opportunity to raise this issue with you. Um, I introduce myself. I'm Scott Levington. I'm the female football coordinator for the Wyla Football League. And on my left <laughs> is Riley Sanders. Riley is involved with the North Wyla Women's Football Competition. Um, yeah, so 2023 was a remarkable year for female sport in Wyla with the launch, successful launch of the Wyla Women's Football Competition. We had uh, over 176 registered players. Um, it was played over 10 rounds. It began the night before the grand final on um, the 13th or well, the 15th of September and finished on the 23rd of November. Uh, the grand final was intended by an estimated over 2,000 people attended the grand final at Memorial Oval. Um, based on that success, um, the Wyla Women's Football um, Committee, uh, which I'm the chair, met in early February, and we had a unanimous vote at that committee to seek um, the use of Memorial Oval for the 2024 football season. Um, that submission was placed with the Wilder Football League a week later. Um, and then a formal request to rent the Oval was was placed in, uh, I think, the 9th of April 2024. Uh, we had to wait a while for a response. Um, but in, I think, the 19th of July, we got a response back from Council saying that we were unsuccessful in securing the Oval and that we'd been that had been earmarked for cricket in 2024 and 2024-25 and that we've been allocated the use of Jubilee Oval um, for our women's competition. Um, so for us um, in this deputation, you know, obviously we have issues with using Jubilee Oval. Um, one is the facilities at Jubilee, even though they've got brand new change rooms, which is really excellent. Um, it's just having those other facilities at the Oval in terms of scoreboard, um, um, shelter for patrons in case it rains, um, seating facilities. Um, I'll show you write them more down, but <laughs> um, I'll write them down. 
canteen um, uh, facilities there. Uh, in terms of canteen, we did make quite a deal of money through the canteen during our football season, and that went to us. Um, there's examples of, you know, the deficiencies of the Oval, but the main um, issue we had with the Oval was the lighting at the Oval. Now, the, the main premise of how we delivered that season and the success of that season was around obviously the venue, but also the ability to play night games and twilight games because we're playing in that period of time that's um, in between summer and autumn kind of thing. I'm missing up the uh, spring <laughs> and it can get quite hot. So it's hard to schedule games during the day. So we, we want to schedule our games in that period of time, uh, either in twilight or night games, and we want to be able to schedule um, double header games where we can get it all over in one go. So we don't want to be going back to the Oval multiple times to play games um, if we can get it all done because of, you know, obviously access to volunteers, helpers to come to the game and participate in setting up those games. And just for one game, it's a lot of work to set up one game. So the, the current lighting at the Oval um, which I walked around with the contractor that the the the, 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 um, the Wireless City Council had hired, and we walked around the oval and we did an assessment of the lighting. So the lighting comes in at about forty to forty five lux. So <laughs> um, now the standards, which I'm happy to um, leave with you, <laughs> the preferred guidelines for um, community football guidelines for 2024 on page. On page 34, outlines um, for amateur, local, remote, junior school trainings area, <laughs> um, the lux capacity for um, competition or, or match practice is 100 lux. So the oval is, uh, and for training, it's 50 lux. And the oval um, doesn't meet those standards. And from what I've been told by the contractor, it's going to take a considerable amount of money to upgrade the lights um, at Jubilee to get it up to that standard. So at this stage, that's probably going to be unlikely uh, for the start of our season. So the argument that I'm bringing towards um, the council tonight is to allow the Wyla, um Football League the Women's League to have access um, to Memorial Oval um, from the 15th of September to the 30th of November, which is scheduled when we want to play our grand final. In saying that, our contract with the Wallace City Council is till the 30th of September, so that would actually take us up to the first three rounds. Um, but at the present, the Wallace City Council is saying we can't use. Um, we can't have access to the Oval for rounds two and three um, for preparation for cricket. <sighs> I'm trying to think. I'm just, um, yeah. So, to cricket, um, lighting, reasons, sorry. It's, you might ask, yeah, the reasons why we're playing it in that, in that, the time zone we have between September and November. One of the issues with women's football is netball. Most of our girls play netball and the netball clubs won't release those players from their A-grade sides to play in the women's competition. That time between uh, the end mid-September to the end of November, um, both netball and <laughs> basketball isn't being played. So not being able to play in that time period means we can't access those players. So yeah, it would be detrimental to us being able to hold that competition. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is one of the other things I've written here is like women's football, you know, one of the fastest growing sports in Australia right now. Um, um, uh, women's football is being extremely um, positive for the clubs involved in this competition. We've had uh, remarkable increases in our volunteers 
at our clubs and our membership at our clubs has expanded through, the, through having women's football at our football clubs. Um, yeah, and just to say, you know what I mean, like um, from our point of view is why shouldn't our female athletes have access to the same fit for purpose facilities as our, um, our boys and men? Uh, because we just don't feel that Jubilee Oval is fit for purpose oval. Um, to play there and comparing it to um, uh, Bennett and Memorial, um, those ovals are already set up for football. So the, one of the other successes of being able to use those venues is we haven't had to reinvent the wheel. Those venues are already in place. And not only the venues uh, and the equipment, but the people. Those people are already in place for us. So all we need to do to play those seasons is basically just ex those people just work longer, but they're already in place. So, um, you know, the gatekeepers, the, um, the ground managers, the canteen um, um, volunteers, they're already there ready to, you know, um, work at those venues to host, host those events. Um, playing at another venue means we're kind of in a grey zone about, you know what I mean, like, how do we set up those ovals? And we only have four weeks at the start of the competition, so we're just looking for certainty going forward. And, yeah, so with that, um, I'm just putting it out to the council. If you have any questions to ask me, I'm here, and both Ryan and I can answer, but we'd like you to consider our proposal. Thank you, Scott. Any quick questions? Councillor Border. Sorry, Kathleen, was actually ahead. Sorry, you'll stand yeah. up first. All right. Councillor Campbell. Thank you. Um, do you have a copy of the proposed timetable of when games would be played? That yes, I do. Yep. I'll table that as well. Very much. And no. what is the square meterage of the surface of Jubilee Park that's covered by the lumens? Was that yes. with the lumens of the um like the lux sorry yeah. uh, for the lighting what yep. square meterage does that cover do you have that uh, probably um the report would be with Alberto uh, you haven't received the report yet Alberto no it's, it was being conducted by a council who contacted um a contractor by the name of Andrew Dunn yep. and he was conducting the survey at the Oval. trying to work out um what the loop to, i'm trying to convert the lux to wattage a bit more in the new term um so i was just wondering what the meter squared was for the oval thank you thank you though yeah, no worries and obviously the, the lux levels are actually quite worse in the goal areas than the whole oval so they'd be quite i think they'd be considerably lower around the goals yeah thank you very much thank you thanks a Councillor Border. Yeah, thanks, Scott. You mentioned 176 players for last season. Yes. How many have you got signed up for this season? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> we haven't. Yeah, we haven't gone through registrations as this as such. Yeah. yeah. Do you anticipate a number above or below what what last season was? Do you think it's growing? You mentioned like it's the fastest growing sport in Australia. Do you think locally here it will continue to pick up at a similar rate or? Well, I yep. well, yeah. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, our numbers are looking like they'll increase. So it's not just in seniors, but also our junior numbers have increased this year as well. So at the moment, the area, especially at the Port Augusta, um, it's very strong. So we're seeing those numbers increase. And I think I've, we've had a chat with Port Augusta. They've had a few more players willing to join up. So I, don't, I can't talk to the Bay, South, West is what their numbers are. But from a North Wales perspective, ours are on the up. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Simpson. You're looking to use both Bennett Oval and Memorial Oval? Only Memorial Oval. Why not Bennett? Because it's got, we don't want to take all the turf wickets away from the Cricket Association. In the submission I've read, there's no mention of Bennett Oval from either of them, from cricket or football. Um, we only Just comment. It, yeah, we only put mention Bennett Oval from either of them. Yeah. It was never offered as an as an alternate location.
Thank you, Alec. Thank you, members. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm um, just going to leave our um, basically our strategic plan. Um, if you want to read it, and so a contract with the license. Okay, just go. Item eight point two is a deputation from the Wilder Cricket Association, John Halloran and Matt Chris. Would you gentlemen like to come up? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we appreciate your time in considering our deputation. Um, I don't think this is a question about gender in sports. It's not a, a, a male versus female aspect. It's about two vastly different codes that require different aspects to use this one facility. Back in August 23, we were approached uh, by the Wild Football League to see whether it was possible to use Memorial Oval, uh, which would encroach into the beginning of our season, um, as the proposed facility of Jubilee was not yet ready for the Women's Football League to, to use. Um, we discussed that and we agreed that to support community sport, that we would uh, move our fixture around to enable them to use that to start their season off as a temporary measure until the other facility was available. Um, we were still under the apprehension that that was the case moving forward. Um, some of the reasons why that difficulty has arisen and we haven't been able to reach an amicable agreement, I'll uh, hand over to Matt Quist, who is able to point out some of the reasons why. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm Matt Quist, I'm the junior coordinator from the Wilder Cricket Association, I have also been vice president and, and taken a number of hats, have been involved for the last 15 years as player and, and um, on committees. So I'm very passionate about cricket within the community, but I'm also a, a person who's been involved in education and physical education. So I'm also somebody who's been a big advocate for um, opportunities for young women in sports. So there's definitely um, a couple of different hats here and we'll just take you through some of the things that we've done as an association. So cricket, I don't know if people in the, in the room have been involved in cricket, but cricket's a unique sport um, and we've definitely experienced some issues over the last few years, particularly within the town, um, about a diminishing competition in terms of numbers. So we work under a governing body of the SACA and they have a pathway zone. So we, within our tri-city area, so Wyala, Port Augusta and Port Pirie, operate under the SACA banner, and then we represent the northern zone. So part of that talent ID pathway is um, essentially in Wyala, we, we bring in participants and then they play for local clubs and we identify talent. They come through, play intercity cricket, and then that talent goes through to a northern zone, which the SACA hopes that they're then plays um, district cricket in Adelaide. So in the last couple of years, we've had zero senior players in that selected country cup team from Wyala. So we've really had to look for alternative ways to increase the quality of cricket played. And then one of the ways we've ventured into um, uh, combining with the Port Augusta Cricket Association and forming what we've called the Super League for the last four years, we were half the season We've played intercity games against Wyala, uh, sorry, Wyala versus Port Augusta um, teams. And this has been what we've been pushing forward to help that talent pathway to try and get children to come in and play and have something to aim for. Now, our negotiations with Port Augusta have meant that um, because we've had the three uh, A-grade teams here and they've had four and now five, um, we've had to leverage with them. And we haven't had that leverage. so. Uh, one of the things we did last year was we um, supported the Wilder Women's Football League and we were very proactive in wanting them to be able to use that memorial facility um, and we were able to, to be a bit creative with our fixturing here, being able to play games, two games at the one oval on the same day. We utilised the lights and we played morning and afternoon games with our A-grade and then we fixtured reserves games on a Friday night and then juniors games on a hard wicket 
and we had the fixture under 17s, which ended up falling through in reserves games on a Sunday. In, in doing that, um, the Port Augusta Cricket Association, we got some negative feedback about the timing and the travel. So say if we started the game here at 10 o'clock, um, the players from Port Augusta would have to leave very early. If we played games that finished at 10 o'clock, they were arriving back home and driving the night. So that was one of the key things that they didn't like. And then we had to leverage with them to say we would have two turf wickets available on a Saturday afternoon to fixture games with Port Augusta teams within the town. And now we've got to the point where one of the Port Augusta teams, we're offering up the potential to host games in Wyala and use the lights facilities because they have shown interest in there. So there's a bit of um, back and forth of that. Um, last year, we dropped a junior grade within cricket, so we established the Cricket Blast program under the guidance of the SACA, which we had 19 new registered participants. Um, there was non-registered participants within those sessions. Our highest attendance was 24, but officially we had 19 um, participants. We had 147 registered senior men's cricket participants, which was a combination of A grade, A reserves, T20 cricket, but we also had some junior players, so they were actually under 14s, um, registering that number as well. We looked to, with our Cricket Blast, establish an under 13s competition with three teams, and we looked to move that under 14s competition with our um, core numbers there up to an under 16s competition. So our aim primarily is, is to increase participation within the town. Um, one of the silver linings with this whole process has been we've had to, as an administration, look into our strategic plan and we've had to change some admin to be able to strengthen what we're doing and have more direction to be able to justify the use of these facilities. Now, a couple of points with the shared use of facilities. We have a historical use of Memorial Oval in particular and then more recently Bennett Oval with the upgrades there. Um, as I said, in 2023-24, we made a decision as a committee and we actually overturned the mindset of our president at the time to then promote the use of um, women's football at Memorial while the Wyala City Council was, and this number comes up in their annual report of 2021-22, was a $425,000 change room development at Jubilee Park Oval. So at the time that was not completed, and therefore we were looking to support that um, competition. Now, at this point, there was only seven teams in that trial half season in the Spencer Golf A grade competition, and now we've moved up to eight and required to be able to schedule those two games at the same time. Um, for those, and again, cricket's a unique sport, but uh, the restoration of a turf cricket pitch is quite unique. So, um, and talking to Alberto, Alberto about some numbers around that, there's an estimated roughly $10,000 cost to bring experts from Adelaide. There's recovery work to go on that turf quick, uh, pitch and a two to three week settling period. So it's not a case of being able to play a game on a Saturday and then say, have a game of football on the turf weekend on a Sunday. If it was, we wouldn't be discussing this here. Um, so it's, yeah. What that does is it leaves the wicket in a, in a damaged and unusable state, which is unfortunate. Um, while the Cricket Association were, and we are still willing to be flexible with the, the fixture in December, um, we know that the, the timing is roughly late September, about two to three weeks of preparation to be able to have games start in mid-October, and our flexibility was looking at um, at, by the end of that November period, being allowed, allowing, well, encouraging the Wyler Women's Football League to host their major um, fixtures in their finals fixtures in November. Um, that was um, knocked back. However, we're still in a position where um, we think that that's a viable thing that we can fix you around um, to support their growth as a competition. Um, a couple of key points in terms of it's understanding that part of the agreement with the Wyler City Council um, with the $890,000 redevelopment of those two major sporting ovals that was their joint funding from governing bodies being the SACA and the Sandful, um, that the ovals would be have priority around seasonal sports in those seasons. Um, 
We understand if, if it was a major Australian rules football governing body that fully funded those upgrades, then if that was around prioritising football all year round, but it just seems a bit unjust that suddenly um, where the SACA had part funded the project that we're going to lose half of our seasonal access to, to that oval. Um, and just, I guess, in on context would beg the, beg the question, if, if Walla Cricket Association were to introduce a women's cricket competition and we were looking at hosting that between, say, July and, and September, um, would we be in the same hit position here wanting to utilise Memorial Oval? Would we have the same response from the Wild Football League? Um, so I guess that context is important. John, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, look, I, I'd like to also just add that um, the council's approach, the, the council admin and, and uh, business staff have been uh, exemplary in their approach towards this. They've been very professional and unbiased, and I think that uh, the report that was listed, 14.3, um, which has a conclusion that, that I think is really probably sums up the entire thing where on balance it's considered there are more practical and cost-effective workaround solutions to accommodate women's football matches in 24 than there is to relocate in cricket from Memorial Oval. Given the limited facilities within our city that support cricket, whilst it's acknowledged and accepted that Memorial Oval better meets the women's football needs, the success and growth of women's football would not be fatally compromised if this facility was not available. Inversely, it is reasonable to conclude that if cricket does not have access to one of the two pitches available, particularly given the recent amalgamation with Port Augusta, this would fatally compromise the code's efforts to reinstate itself. Um, so, you know, I think that we should take heed of, of the uh, professional approach from, from the council. And if it was in our capacity to both use the same facilities and not impact on them, we would be more than open to doing that. It's, it's as Matt said, the turnaround of uh, repair and maintenance of, of the ovals and the pitches. And, you know, we spent five years working with Port Augusta to develop this Super League program with a view to expanding that further down the track, including Port Pirie. Now, we have had initial negotiations with them, which would then create the premier cricket competition outside of Adelaide in the country, and that's our own. We, we have a whole new committee. Um, we're pretty proactive, and we want to ensure that there's a game there for our future generations. So, thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Oh, sorry. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Simpson. Only your senior decide to play on turf wickets. It's the reserves and juniors play on hard wickets. No, so we, we, it has been in the past, and part of our strategic plan has been to have all junior and A reserve cricket on turf wickets. So the last couple of years, the reserves have, and the juniors haven't, and part of our plan is to utilise those facilities to have two junior grades playing on turf wickets. When we progress through that uh, pathway, Bill, so playing combined cricket into city is that first step, and the next step is country cup, northern areas. So we play South East, Barossa, and they play on turf wickets. So if I find that kids have played all their cricket on hard wicket and then get to play on turf, it's a completely different aspect. The, the, the ball moves around a lot more and they're not prepared. And we've had some success with uh, kids in our competition moving through. Angus Judd made the Australian under-19 side. Ben Pengelly and Josh Pengelly made the state teams. Um, so the talent pool's there and we need to give them the option of being able to use the turf facilities and that's part of our plan uh, for juniors. Just when I played years ago, with all the seniors that play, the A-rate play on turf and we all play on hard wicket. So that means Chilts Reserve and the old Lionel High School Oval is all nothing. Not good for you guys at all. Well, they're not used now while the high is. I mean, with Schultz yeah. Reserve, with, yeah. So, so Schultz is, and we have used that in the past when there's been problems with uh, rain, et cetera, we, we had to. Um, but it certainly doesn't prepare our, our particularly our junior cricketers. Yeah. 
I mean, with, with the associated costs, we've tried to isolate our cricket to those two main ovals to justify the, the council's cost in keeping up the ovals. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Knox, did I see your name? Oh, right, thank you. Any further questions? Thank you very much, Alexa. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, we will be addressing that later in the agenda. Yeah. She has come up with a, a good suggestion. Would you care to amend the agenda and bring uh, item item 14.34 forward and deal with that now? If you're so inclined, would somebody care to move that way? Move Councillor Todd, seconded Councillor Border. I'll put the motion, bringing the item forward to be addressed now. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Right, we'll just move on to the item. You've had a very extensive report. <clears throat> we'll take that as read before I look for any way forward. Would anybody care to raise any questions or comments? Councillor Simpson. I, I appreciate the fact that council administration have met on two or three occasions with both these groups. I wouldn't mind the feedback from, from them. <laughs> As far as what their thoughts are, because they've been they've been involved just in detail. We only just heard now from the gentleman and the minutes. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. There's not much more to add than what we've put in the report, and I believe both deputations covered um, uh, all that we thought we could submit other than I have got the Lux report and, and could could talk to that if you wanted Councillor Campbell in a, relation to the square meterage that the globes cover and the, the lights, but that's reinforced in the report and um, Scott's um, summation is backed up by that data that it's very patchy and doesn't meet um, 100 Lux at all um, and happy to share that report um, that we've received. Uh, but it, it it, there's not much more that I would add that's that's not in contained in the council report. Um, we acknowledge Jubilee's deficiencies in relation to to that, and and just to be fair, when you think of um, the Jubilee Oval, it was always meant to be a spillover training facility, um, and as this is standard um, identified, so it it kind of meets that criteria of the training facility very much so. Of course, we've invested in the change room, so that, that would indicate that we are uh, considering a third facility. Um, and the only other additions I'll say is, is that we have considered um, the negotiations of uh, trying to find the sweet spot between the minimum time for the preparation of the cricket pitch and the use of Memorial Oval. But there comes a time where there's a deadline and that pitch preparation has to go ahead without any other encumbrance. So, but happy to take any questions you might have had um, that we generated by the report. Any further quest uh, questions, Councillor Simpson? Yeah, the starting times can't be massaged to make it easier on one or the other, no? Because one starts in October, one starts September. You're wondering back and they kick forward. No. Uh, She's trying to find a compromise. Yeah, no, that's yeah. That, that's certainly that's certainly possible. Uh, the only line in the sand is that minimum time between securing the contract help to prepare the cricket pitch itself. Um, there's a there's a three to four week period that 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 has to go ahead unencumbered. 
Um, but yes, there was was absolute negotiations as to when the seasons could be tweaked to start and end. Um, uh, and was it possible to say to cricket, you can have Bennett and football has Royal? And that's it. Uh, yes, certainly, as the cricket um, uh, representatives expressed in their deputation. However, they're seeking to build a business case with the use of two turf wickets. And as that stands, that's Bennett and Memorial Oval. Um, you'll see in the report around an estimate of 150,000 to create another turf wicket or remove one to create a new one. I'm more involved in the fact that if to, to, to appease both parties, you say the cricket, Bennett Oval's yours. So you've got a turf wicket, roll for it, and Memorial Oval's football. That won't the, work, yeah. you don't think. Uh, that, that is something cricket don't believe will sustain them moving forward. Yes, or not? Just a little suggestion that may or may not work. Um, we've got the hydrogen camp going in pretty close to Jubilee Park. They will develop some facilities in that area. Is it possible to talk to them about the potential to improve the lighting at Jubilee Oval for their use as well. Maybe we can get some funding from them. Absolutely, most most definitely. Um, uh, the community survey results from Hydrogen themselves when they proposed the village, um, the loud and clear message from the community was uh, enough with new make sure our offerings are built up to scratch and that we've got that full capacity of each of our offerings to, to deliver. So um, to your point, we would more than happily put that proposition and we've been actively seeking the, the quotes for the upgrade of the lights to meet the Australian standard. Councillor Simpson? And that's a good idea, but what we're saying, there's no shade, there's no cover, there's no facilities other than change room. So they didn't think they didn't think you would be suitable. Deputy Mayor Pond. I've got the same way of thinking as Councillor Simpson. I think there are too many barriers for women's football. It's not just the lighting. It's the scoreboards, it's the shelter, it's the canteen. I think there needs to be a compromise between the two sites. I I in an ideal world, yes, two pitches for cricket, great. But I think there is capacity here for negotiation. Mops football, Bennett cricket. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any further comments or questions? In that case, Councillor Border. Yeah. Oh. Uh, My yeah. names don't have all come up the same as your audit. Sorry, Councillor yeah, Todd. Just um might seem like a silly question and I, but I don't know the answer to it. Is just the next season the issue or is this perceived is this going to be an ongoing issue? Because for me that that changes the way I think about it. If it's a one season only thing and um, you know we're looking at possibly developing other facilities or improving the lights. So as Councillor uh, sorry as Deputy Mayor says we're not going to fix all the other issues out at Jubilee Park. But is this perceived to be a season only issue or is it going to be an ongoing issue? I think at, at this stage it's trying to satisfy immediate requirements for this year while we then look forward and see how we're going to progress in the future, but if my understanding is correct. That's, that's absolutely correct. Um, we are, are working um, to deliver an improved um, sporting capacity in town using um, some state government funding. Um, so we can't definitively answer your question, um, Councillor Todd, in terms of um, we can guarantee that by next season we'll have another facility that could suit either of these two codes, um, but we're certainly working very hard towards that. Thank you. Councillor Border. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you to the um, deputations um, and the way that they were presented and for the research and the negotiation that the administration put forward. My question is, 
from what I noted down from what Scott had said, that rounds two and three in the Women's Football League competition are affected directly. And there's obviously the issues that Deputy Met um, Pond and, and Councillor Simpson have recom have acknowledged as well with the scoreboard and the shelter and the seating. And the flip side of that is that the Cricket Association would then have to compromise and have a hard wicket instead of two turf wickets. How long is that, that for the entire women's football season from the 15th of September to the 30th of November? Do I understand that correctly? I think you've got it spot on. Okay. Yep. So that's, where, that's what we're balancing up right now. Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. Fun decision to make. Awesome. It's okay. Right. Any further questions or comments? I echo the councillor's comments about the deputations. Thank you very much. And the detail in the reports. I will now call, you have the uh, recommendations there. You've had the deputations. I will call for a mover of the recommendation. Would somebody care to move? Councillor Knox? Reluctantly, I will move it. We have a mover of the motion. Does anybody wish to second? We have no seconder. Motion fails. Does anybody have an alternate motion? <laughs> Councillor Simpson. Give me a minute. Yes, I, I like to think that I don't know how to word it though. I like to think that we put this on. Just let me think about it for a minute. That we defer this until next for, for another a briefing session, perhaps next Monday. See if we can come up with alternatives. That's not a motion. Yeah, it's a suggestion. Yeah. Hang on. It's a motion to put it to further matter. Yeah. Um, so if um, that needs to be put straight to the council, if someone seconds it, yep. then that's what needs to be dealt with. Yes. If that's a formal motion, Council, if somebody wishes to second it, then it can be dealt with. So your motion is to defer this to a further briefing next week. Does anybody wish to second that? Seconded by Councillor Campbell, so we have a motion. Moved and seconded to defer this to a further briefing next week. The point of order. If we defer this to a meeting next week, and I do agree we should do that, but if we do, we can't make any decision at a, at a briefing session. We really need to defer it to a special meeting because the seasons are getting closer and closer and closer. We can't hang around and have a briefing and then refer it to the next month's meeting. Special meeting, yeah. If I may add to that last comment through the mayor, um, as the director of city growth has said, council essentially has got all the information in form in front of you today in the form of both the report from the administration and deputations. So, in order to make a decision, if you want to discuss this matter tonight, is an opportunity to discuss the matter. If you need to Further information, you need to advise us what further information you need to help inform your decision. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Councillor Border. Question. So if this motion is lost and we don't have a relevant alternate motion, what happens then? Like, is it up to us on the spot now to come up with? Um, as per the advice provided uh, at the last meeting, uh, where a council motion is lost, um, the default position is that we go back to custom standard practice um, prevailing uh, conditions. So the prevailing conditions is that um, cricket has got the license or lease um, from what date? Up from October to March. So the, uh, if this is lost, we will continue to work on the basis that a um, cricket has access to memorial for that 
pre, um, predetermined period. So then motion passed or motion lost, women's football rounds two and three are still having to modify themselves. Whether this motion is passed now or it's lost, but if, a new, if it goes back to the status quo, we're still going to have to, not we, but the Women's Football League is still going to have to adjust rounds two and three. It's more than rounds two and three, and I think they've been provided the opportunity to have their finals, Alberto. Yep, but there'll be more than rounds, just two rounds that will be impacted with the status quo. Okay. Well, if I go out on a limb um, and say, what would need to happen to make that not the case? For lack of a better way of putting it. Yeah, you've got a formal motion on the table. So you need to deal with that on the motion. Yeah, point of order, quite correctly, we do have a formal motion on the table. I will have to deal with that first. So we have a motion to defer this for a further special meeting or reason. The motion was briefing. Yeah, briefing. Okay. If the mover wants to move yep. an amendment to what was initially moved to defer to a special meeting of council and nominate the seek leave to support that yeah. delegation. Yes, council. If you if we now do change that from a briefing to a special meeting. You need to seek leave from the seconder that the seconder is happy for to change from a briefing to a special meeting. Yes. I... Sorry, I was looking at the wrong person. Council. <laughs> Council. What, do I say I give permission or yes or what, whatever the positive? I'll you give leave. give leave. Yes. But in that case, the motion becomes to defer this to a special meeting. 26. 26 of August. Councillor Todd? Oh, or is sorry. Your... You have to put that yeah. in no, yeah. no debate. Yeah. So I'll put that motion. You know where we're going? The motion is that it gets deferred to a special meeting on the 26th of August. Those in favour? Against? The motion is carried. It has been deferred. Thank you for your input. <laughs> oh, we just get Councillor Ingus back in. Item nine is petitions. We have none. Item 10, public question time. We have no questions. Item 11, the council member activities. As you will be able to see on the screen, some very busy elected members. If there's any in particular that anyone wishes to add to, now's your time to comment. Uh, Deputy Mayor Pond. My apologies, I haven't put my list of engagements in. I've been a little bit busy, but I will get them to you hopefully tomorrow to be added. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. No further uh, comments there. Item 12 with presentations, 12.1. Mr Williams, a resident of Wyla, he would like to present on uh, the introduction of a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Mr Williams, you like to. Come up and address. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for letting me say a few things. It's just a follow up from uh, my question, my last question of, at the last council meeting. 
So uh, I'm not sure if anybody had a chance to. Sorry, is that all right? To you? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure if anybody had a, a chance to read the email that I sent out. But all I'm going to do is just go through the points in that email, basically. So if you if you miss anything I say tonight, it's it's there anyway. So um, <clears throat> what what I'm trying to do is just increase awareness of the treaty. It's called the TPNW, which is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And what's happening is there's a group called the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which is called ICANN, which they dropped the W off because ICANN sounds a bit better. So they're sort of encouraging councils to endorse a motion encouraging the federal government to sign and ratify the TPNW. I know it's a bit long-winded, but... What happened was Albanese, before he became uh, Prime Minister, said that he would uh, sign and ratify the TPNW. But he hasn't done it for umpteen reasons. And if Whaler Council um, moved the motions and said, we, we agree to encourage him, it's not really going to change anything. It's just going to encourage him. There's about 40 councils already done it. Adelaide Council recently did it. Uh, Port Augusta Council did it a while, a while ago. But there's a few questions with it all, of course, like, uh, all right, we'll just, I'll go through it. Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, also called the Ban Treaty. It's enforced by the, well, it's a legal thing and it's the United Nations are behind it and ICANN is behind it as well. And, uh, well, it's probably too much to go through in five minutes, but here's a couple of points. <laughs> How does it relate to AUKUS? That's probably a question. You know, this, AUKUS is throwing a spanner in the works, really. But what um, it can still be done. It can still, even <clears throat> so, even though AUKUS is whatever whatever happens with it, there's still umpteen things to go on there. But it's still possible to sign the total prohibition on nuclear weapons, even though. Uh, the federal Labor government's proceeding with AUKUS. So you could say, well, all right, what treaties has Australia already signed? Australia's already signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, 1968. <coughs> Australia signed the South Pacific Nuclear Free Zone Treaty, which is also called the Rarotonga Treaty, and they signed that in 1986. So why should Australia sign another treaty? Well, it's because the new ones are stronger. The new treaty bans further production of nuclear weapons. It bans the production of plutonium and highly enriched uranium for weapons, regulates the use of existing stockpiles, prevents, this is probably important regarding AUKUS, it prevents the stationing of nuclear weapons in the territory of the signatory, and in, in our case, Australia. So it's, it's really a push to try just a small aim, it's really a push to try and rid the world of nuclear weapons, but one step at a time. But, how, you know, then the next question is, how would signing the TPNW affect Australia's relationship with the US? And that's probably a question, you know, that was the thing why the previous coalition government held back. This federal open government we've got now is, you know, more open to these sorts of things. So, right, well, here's the point. There's nothing in the TPNW, the Total Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which prevents military cooperation with a nuclear armed state, provided nuclear weapons are excluded. So you can still have all the AUKUS submarines, but you couldn't have nuclear weapons on the submarines. And the TPNW will just help in that regard. Now, the, this I can, Australia, Sorry, international campaign against nuclear weapons. It's an international campaign, but a big part of that was actually instituted in Australia in about 2007. And actually, ICANN won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Uh, so it's, you know, they've got a lot, look, they're, they're very dedicated. They've done a lot of work. So this, this pushes a well-respected sort of a thing and, um, all I'm trying to do is just try and explain it a bit. 
because naturally I'd like council to endorse this, but it's, you know, I'm not here to coerce anybody, I'm only doing a presentation. So I'd like to suggest that somebody at some time on the council puts forward a motion to support the city's appeal, which says, well, it's a bit long-winded, and you don't actually have to have all the whole wording of all this. You could just say, while the council supports the ICANN City's appeal to support the to, to support the federal government endorsing the TPNW. <laughs> Does that all make sense? It's just trying to it's just adding a voice to this ICANN City's appeal. That's that's what it's doing. You know, and, and if you don't want to do it, that's all right. That's up to up to everybody. And, you know, if someone, not necessarily even at this meeting, at some point, if you want more time to think about it, you know, just read the email. It mightn't be your thing, or you might think, no, it's good, good, we'll add our name. It's not going to, if we put the name on there, it's not going to actually make any decisive change. It's only going to be a help. So the final point is ratifying the TPNW is, the, is in the best, this is you know, my opinion, other people's opinion, Ratifying the TPNW is in the best interest of the collective security of humankind and the environment. So it's, you know, it's a big deal. It's something that could be done, but there are complications. And, you, and right, any questions or comments? And hopefully that... I think, I think you presented sense. well, Mr Williams. Thank you. Okay, no worries. Yeah. No, thank you. Can I just... Thank you. Yes, thanks, Phil. I just want to say thank you very much for your presentation. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Item 13, committee reports. 13.1, the Mount Laura Homestead Advisory Group meeting of 9th of July. We have a recommendation that we note the minutes of the advisory group. Move Councillor Knox, seconded Councillor Todd. I'll put the motion, those in favour, against, carried. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. On yes. those minutes? Mount Laura, they stated in those minutes that they advised, they wanted to, they applied to have a shed erected and didn't get the answers or didn't get approval. I just wondered why not. Would you like me to fill you in on the conversation around that at the mean, at the meeting? Thank you, Councillor. Yep. So um, I went along as the council representative, and um, basically, it, it, as it's a new group, there were lots of things um, I'm going to say being rehashed from previous groups that had been um, part of the Mount Laura Homestead Committee, I guess. One of the things was the fact that they had applied to build a shed, uh, they had, and had paid a five hundred, sorry, five thousand dollar deposit for said shed before they had approval. And the idea was to store, uh, and this was just the committee's idea, was to store all of the bits and pieces from uh, Wyala High School, the closed down Stuart High School, the closed down Air High School, honour boards, etc., in this shed to display them in the shed. So the conversation was along the lines of the shed wasn't approved because um, Paul Mizurik is in the process of looking at an appropriate way to display and store those items so they're not damaged. Um, so that was why the shed wasn't approved because they want to build it wherever they want to build it just to put everything in it on display. And the... Um, Paul Mizurik said that it was something that needed to be explored further because part of the um, information was about making sure that the um, display items at the homestead were stored appropriately um, and in a way that they wouldn't be damaged or wind affected or water affected or anything like that. So that was that was a particular person who if you excuse the expression, dog with a bone about the fact that he wanted to build a shed. So, but it's not actually the um, committee's 
request the committee don't want to build the shed it was suggested that they get their money back and wait until they determine what's an appropriate way to store the equipment and where would be an appropriate place to build whatever they're going to build to store said equipment Does that yeah make sense? i did read all that i'm just saying that why was it approved by council it, it made as if council had knocked it back yeah well it i don't think council knocked it back i think um the the purpose of it was not back from the Mount Laura Homestead Museum, thing that back as opposed to the council saying you can't build a shed. One of the other things too was the discussion around people out the out there building. Uh, sorry, people out there building sheds wherever a person decided a shed should go, rather than having a holistic, constructive approach to how the Mount Laura Homestead Museum progresses. So that was part of the conversation as well. And I've got hit up as well. <laughs> I can add to that. Um, an application was proposed to council um, for a shed to be constructed um, towards the street boundary. Um, there was no um, agreement between the trust and council. The um, documentation had been sitting unsigned for a long time, so there was no agreement between the parties. Also, the site is quite large and that they just purchased a shed to place right at the front of the property. We were talking to them about a better location for said shed or was the shed the most appropriate building you know the most modern most appropriate um given the planning policies to be right at the front to be the entrance the first thing you see when you arrive at the um at the museum so it was um i don't for i don't think formally rejected by council um to, so the, the formal process hasn't occurred but because the two items the um mou hadn't been signed and that there wasn't didn't appear to be an agreement through the trust that that was the best location for the shed and the policies don't support a shed um, in that location that it was sort of just put to bed waiting for the outcome thank you very much for the explanations thank you councillor item right, um, 13 point Yes, we won't say that. Item 13.2, the Audit and Risk Committee meeting of 29th of July. We have uh, the minutes there. Would somebody care to move the recommendation? Move Councillor Koblika, seconded Councillor Border. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Item 14, reports from Council Officers, 14.1, the Office of the Chief Executive. 14.1.1, the Chief Executive Officer's Action Report for August. August. I'll take the report as read, and if anybody has any questions of the CEO before I call for a mover. Yep, no questions, but over to the CEO. Um, just wanted to um, share with the councillors that I attended a luncheon on Friday um, uh, called Australia, um, Stronger Australia Adelaide. I'm not sure who come up with the name. It's um, a bit of an unusual title, but it was essentially um, co-hosted by the Business Council of Australia and another group who's it's going to escape me. But the purpose of the luncheon um, had four uh, guest speakers, and it was to talk about making Adelaide a stronger place um, in terms of our economy. Um, and I just um, found it um, really pleasing to note that um, while it was probably mentioned that if 15 to 20 times uh, during the luncheon, um, and it almost felt like it was actually a whale of luncheon as opposed to an Adelaide luncheon. So we actually got more airtime um, discussed at that luncheon than um, than the rest of Metropolitan Adelaide, which was uh, very pleasing. So I thought I'd just share that with the councillors. Thank you, CEO. Very nice. Right, there are no uh, questions of the CEO from his report. We have a recommendation. Would somebody care to move the recommendation, please? Move Councillor Border, seconded Councillor Todd. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. 14.1.2, to nominate for the SA Flood Warning Consultative Committee. By tradition, there is a recommendation. You can have either two. Does anybody wish to have got the background or the interest to nominate? Or do we just note the report under reference? 
If there's no one wishes to nominate, would somebody care to move the motion that we note the report under reference? Move Councillor Knox, seconded Councillor Simpson. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. 14.1.3 Australia Day. We have a report with a two part recommendation. Again, before I call for a mover, does anybody, we'll take the report as read. Does anybody have any questions? Councillor Border. I'd like to move an alternate motion, please. Certainly, Councillor Border. So the motion would be that Council endorses that until such time as the Federal Government changes the official date of Australia Day, that from 2025 onwards, the Australia Day Community Picnic, Australia Day Citizenship Ceremony, Australia Day Awards all be held on the 26th of January and be named and referred to as such. The location for awards and citizenship ceremony could be held at the Council Chambers either before or after the community picnic. And that's it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Campbell, are you seconding that? No, I'd like to. Right. Is, does somebody wish to second Councillor Border's motion? Councillor Inglis. I will, yep. You're seconding. Therefore, we have an alternative motion. I'll put that motion. No. Sorry. Might be some, might want to speak. Councillor Knox, I had the same. Um, I... just be, just, yeah. Sorry, just before Councillor Knox speaks, you should ask the mover and the seconder to speak to yeah. the item before you ask for other. Oh, thank you. See, uh, get it right one day. <laughs> Does the mover and the seconder care to speak to the motion? I just want to refer to what I've previously said when this motion was uh, at Council, the, there was a decision made at that point um, and we're looking at a very similar circumstance again. Along the lines of what I'd said last time is the citizenship ceremony I don't see affecting uh, people that would not like Australia Day at all. And I think moving that date, the date of the citizenship ceremony specifically, <laughs> achieves no more respect and no more valuing of Indigenous culture. And the Australia Day Awards, again, as previously mentioned, I feel as though if people do have a problem with it being received on Australia Day, that we make an alternate arrangement on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, Councillor. Seconder? I agree with everything that Peter said. And I mean, I, I don't think it's up to us to be changing this. It's the federal government and it's up to the Prime Minister to show some leadership and do it. I don't think it should be come back to us as a council or, or as a community because you know it, it does divide and everybody so it needs to be some leadership from the federal government and then everybody else can get in line and follow suit thank you council councillor knox um while i agree with the um the sentiment in some way of the the new motion i would much prefer that the awards take place at the picnic or event in the Ada Ryan Gardens and not separately in the civic building. If there are some that do not want theirs done at that time, then they can be done separately. Um, but I believe everything should take place down there. I think we need to come together as, as one group of Australians, and I, I hate to see divisions occur. So I can't support that as it is. Uh, I want to see everything take place at the Ada Ryan Gardens. Thank you, Councillor. Any further comments? Councillor Campbell. I think um, I, I'm, ag I'm against 
the um, citizenship and the award state being held, not by, by being forced on people to be on that date, if I may speak to that. I believe that in our charter, we have the words inclusive, diverse, progressive. I think each of those stand for us coming forward with the voice that we represent, which is the community. I think by making the choice for some people in this community that if they're going to receive citizenship and they're going to be recognised by our community as a citizen of the year, that that should be done in a moment that instills them with pride, that makes them feel joyful and that reflects upon us showing them the respect that they deserve receiving such an award. I've taken the time to speak to some people within our local Aboriginal community. I've spoken to one person that has received an award on the day of the 26th and not on the day of 26, who is of Aboriginal descent. And I can tell you that their experience of receiving that award on Australia Day was a vastly different experience for them as it was when it wasn't on Australia Day. Receiving that award, giving the option and the choice of not receiving that on Australia Day, they were able to be excited about that award. They were able to feel a sense of pride. They felt that their pride in that award was, was supported by their heritage and by the people in their community and their mob. When they received an award on Australia Day, they cried before that award, they received that award, and they cried after. I do not have Aboriginal descent, but I have taken the time to speak to people in Wyla that I do know that do. I cannot sit here as a Caucasian person and say that I understand how they feel. I cannot sit here as a member of this council and make a decision for them that is based on generational trauma and go against our charter of inclusion, <laughs> diversity and progression and vote for something that is supposed to make them feel good, to make them feel recognised by their community, to make them feel like their thoughts, their feelings and their efforts in our community is being recognised when it's going to cause them pain. I think as a council, we should be providing a choice where the things that we do to recognise the people in our community, whether as individuals or collectively as a group, reflects what we're trying to achieve, and that is community. If at any point we're doing anything in our community that causes division for anyone, any minority in our community, we are not doing it right. And that's what I have to say on that matter. Thank you very much, Councillor. Any other further? Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Todd. So um, I'd like to speak against it as well. Um, personally, I'd prefer to go with the original recommendation. I think if you, ref if you, for me, the RAP, the Reconciliation Plan, our charter, the fact that we're supposed to show leadership, the concepts of inclusion and diversity and um, those sorts of things, I think, are reflected in the first recommendation and not in the second. That's simply... Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Deputy Mayor Pond. Councillor Campbell and Todd have put it beautifully. I see the recommendation that is the first one is absolutely the one that I would be supporting. The second one I see is the most probably disrespectful and, yeah, um, you put it beautifully. I will absolutely not be accepting the motion that has been first and seconded. Any further comments or questions? In that case, I will put the alternative motion. Can I? Do I have? Oh, sorry. Do I have an opportunity? Do I have an opportunity as the mover to? Yeah. Yes. Yes, as the mover. So I just want to. I think we need to clarify what diverse, inclusive and progressive mean. Because there is a big proportion of the community that I've spoken to as well, from Indigenous and non-Indigenous background. 
I don't claim to understand what it feels like at all, as much as anybody at this table. But these words get used, and instead of including, I feel as though they are divisive in themselves. We could go around the table, we could spend a three hour workshop on this and still arrive, and we have done, and still arrive at where we are now, which is democracy is we put a motion and we vote, and I will accept whatever the will of the council is. But what I do feel very put out by is the, the reference and the implication that somehow this motion is going against our charter and somehow this is an, an act of disrespect. That's just simply not the case. There's a bigger issue at play here. I'm happy to have the conversation. I'm happy to sit with anybody and respectfully discuss the date of Australia Day. And that's what I feel is being questioned. And that's why the motion is when the date changes, we will, we will go with that. But putting half somewhere, a citizenship ceremony, which as I said, I don't think affects Indigenous people whatsoever. And the award ceremony, People do have choice. If they don't want to receive it on the day, they can receive it another day. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. That wraps up the discussion. So we have a motion. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Tied vote. Yes, it's a tied vote. The motion is lost. The, uh, the amendment. Just for everyone's benefit in terms of language, an alternate motion was moved and seconded. So that is the motion. That is what's been dealt with. And that motion has lost. If Now that that's been lost, um, you could ask whether there's an alternate motion or whether the councillors wish to reconsider the recommendation from yeah. the staff, given that um, at present, as per the report, we don't really have good, solid custom practice to lean back on because of changes that have been made in recent years as a result of both uh, COVID and the decision that council made roughly this time last year, which was to change the timing of the uh, citizenship and award ceremony to be on a day other than Australia Day. Um, so we do, as an administration, need uh, clear direction from Council what we do for 2025. Councillor Simpson. So I propose the original recommendation, 14.1.3. No, I would second that motion. Move Councillor Simpson, seconded Councillor Todd. There's no further comments or questions. I'll put that motion. Those in favour? Uh, is your hand up or down, Councillor Inglis? Down. The motion is carried. Right, item 14.3. Two, Corporate Services Ordinary Reports 14.2.1, the monthly budget report for July 2024. We'll take it as read. If anybody has any questions or comments, I'm sure our, we can refer those to our finance bureau. <coughs> Councillor Klobuchar? Yes, just a couple of questions. Uh, first one is the rates. It's $1.6 million worth of rates outstanding. Um, I'm curious as what we're doing to collect these. Um, yeah, so there, there is $1.6 million outstanding. It's um, much lower than we were at 12 months ago, so we've had a reduction of around $600,000 in outstanding rates from um, undertaking the Section 184 process. Um, as per our policy, so all of our debt collection processes are in place. So we um, you know, undertake debt collection on a quarterly basis um, as we go through um, as quarters full due and 
and people uh, go into arrears and haven't set a payment plan. Um, and then, you know, we we work through that debt collection process, but we don't have a lot of power to force people to pay um, at that stage. Um, some people will, some people won't. Um, and obviously, once we then move further down the, pro the the stream to being three years in arrears, that's when we get a bit more power and we can sort of um, commence, often commencing the Section 184 process, we'll see um, uh, results. So we have we did, we brought a report to count, I gave council update a couple of months ago that we were sort of unofficially commencing the next round of Section 184s. Um, we have already seen a bit of success from that process. Um, and then what we'll do and what will happen in the next few months is we'll officially start the section 84 from those that haven't engaged with council from that process. Because it's about half a million dollars worth of them. That's not right. Yeah, that's probably, yeah, it's about right. So yeah, about a third of our outstanding relate to properties, you know, that about to, um, to about 40 properties from memory that um, were over three years in arrears and we're not making any effort to, to make payment. Um, so yeah, they're the, they're the ones that we uh, um, we can start dealing with, um, and yeah, that they make up sort of roughly a third of our outstanding. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Just another question, oh, and um, and also noting that we do receive interest on all the amounts that are outstanding okay. as per yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there was thirty thousand dollars spent on consultants in July. And I'm just curious as to uh, who they were and what they were used for. Yeah, um, you might have to. I'll take that on notice. I can provide some information probably in five minutes or so, but I'll just. Yeah, because it was only July, I didn't um, do the full breakdown of that as yeah. I normally would. Yeah, and the monthly project update, is that part of your? Yes, that forms part of this report, yes. Just just curious, and I might be a bit naive here, but um, obviously I've seen the toilets down the beach. They look fantastic, um, but $300,000 just seems like a lot of money. Um, can you just give us some context on that? Why are they so expensive? Yep, yeah, um, so I've had lots of questions on Facebook about that one as well. We're giving some some answers on it. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't set the market. Um, the market sets the market. Um, so um, yeah, we we went out to tender um, for toilets previously. It was for the Northern Coastline. So this is being done sort of um, as a as a follow up to the Northern Coastline project that we couldn't go ahead with. But we tested the market. Then we got five responses at the time. Um, and yeah, this company was the the winner of that, the, the you know the cheapest, well, the, the best price for what they were delivering um, as per an assessment process. So, um, you know, unfortunately, council doesn't set the price for these projects. The, the market does. Um, the price for the toilets themselves is two hundred and fifty-five thousand. Um, that site also needed demolition um, services, upgraded, um, and other landscaping works around it, which are we've got a budget of about fifty. 50,000, 45 to 50,000 for. And then with this project, we've got a contingency in there of 10%. So one thing we've probably failed at in the past few years is actually having a sufficient contingency. So there's a good possibility this project may actually be delivered under budget um, uh, because they haven't run into too many on, on site issues. Um, but yeah, so that's the breakdown of it. So it's 340, but actually 255 is the toilet plus another 54. All the things that go around a project such as that. I can just add to that. I've built single block toilets in playgrounds before. By and large, they they retail for around one hundred and eighty thousand for a single public toilet. Um, we have literally purchased the cheapest toilet block you can get in the flat plat terrain modular structure that we've got. Um, if you have a look at at most council budgets now for a, for a very standard toilet block, you will look at half a million baseline. So we have purchased the most um, basic model toilet you can provide, and we've done it up with a vinyl wrap. Um, the additional cost on behalf, on top of the 255, a lot of that relates to our sewerage connection to um, uh, the system that that down on the foreshore, each time we do a build down there, will require additional works around utility provision. And one last thing, I think we, we responded quite well on Facebook about this one, but I think that's a good example of, and it, someone brought up the some work that Port Lincoln did at a toilet, and they said, oh, they only spent $120,000. And so looking into that, they refurbished, so, that, so just refurbishing a toilet 
is $120,000. I, mean, I don't know what the inside of it actually looks like, but that's what they did. Um, so, you know, we didn't think that refurbishing that toilet was actually appropriate for the position and, and the prominence and the age of the building. Um, and the pictures of the Port Lincoln one look amazing, but it's because they've spent a lot of money on building a frame around the outside that makes it look like a, an Art Deco building with a wooden frame that looks amazing, but that's not part of the $120,000. So some of, you know, that we've responded to that on Facebook, but that that's a little bit of a, you know, people can get a bit mixed up with budgets and, and what you can actually deliver for what price, um, you know, that, that's actually a comparison that for half the price of the buying the new toilet, the two fifty five is is going to cost at least half of that to refurb and, you know, are you getting a good product out of that or something that will actually meet expectations. So. And and just to add to that, in future, particularly wherever we choose our toilet block location, so if we do upgrade the wetlands, you'll be looking at significantly more. So you'll be approaching the four to five hundred thousand dollar mark for, for for a toilet, mostly due to the utilities connections that we need to do here in Whaler. Councillor Knox. My neighbouring council member has asked most of my questions, but I've got one left. Okay. Um, the money from the sale of the YTEC or Wide building, did that go straight into debt reduction? Yes, that's right. That was okay. pulled through about 12 months ago. So basically it paid down approximately a million or just over a million dollars of debt. Um, and yeah, and flowed through as interest rate reduction, over interest reduction over the term of the long term financial plan. Thank you. Councillor Inglis. Just getting back to us, the is toilet. So they're going to be locked at night and are they vandal proof? Or how vandal proof are they? They would have been more vandal proof if we'd spent more money. <laughs> and that's being genuine, not 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 cheeky. That's the truth. We have purchased one of the most basic flat packed models that you can get. Um, we'll do everything we can to secure them um, and have them um, uh, uh, the vinyl wraps vandal proof in terms of graffiti and those types of things. If you really would like to consider a vandal proof toilet block, you'll have to double the budget. And your example, best example would be Apex Park in Port Augusta. Um, if you have a pop in there and have a look at that. Toilet block. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So Councillor Border. That context and those prices, is that appropriate to be given out at the start of the discussion with the community? So when it's released that we are, you know, 340 grand worth of toilet that was being put in, that context that you've just given there is really meaningful to me. And I reckon we may have put off some of the initial, I mean, when it's 255 compared to 340 is a bit of a jump. Um, I mean, I'm sure that people will still say 255 is too expensive, but I think that, I think that context might help. So just wanted to put it out there. Yeah, I think we've had discussions with Sean. There's a few learnings from this one and, and what, yeah, what people's expectations are. So that'll be good for the next similar project. So. Right, thank you for all your questions and comments. So we have a motion there, uh, a recommendation rather, that we receive and note the monthly budget report. Do I detect to move Councillor Knox, second the Deputy Mayor Pond? I'll put the motion, those in favour, against, carried. Thank you. Item 14.2.2, .2, Review of Finance Policies. Thanks, Pete. Take them as read and any questions or comments to our Knowledge and Finance Manager. I've got it. Uh, sorry, Councillor Knox. I think Councillor Clubby Right. Okay. He's not um, even on the screen now. I'm just talking about the hardship policy here. Um, and I am the credit financial counsellor. I don't work in that field anymore. Um, but it refers to a welfare agency. And that's, that's sort of worries me a bit because there are a lot of welfare agencies in while that don't employ financial counsellors. Um, so I wonder how they can reach um, a valid recommendation. So we have a partnership with Centre Care locally um, and they're happy for us to refer yeah, and yeah, Anglicare sure. have, have them as well, um, but we're, we're talking about welfare, financial council or a welfare agency, and I'm just saying some welfare agencies don't have accredited financial counsellors and would not be in a position to make a valuable recommendation. Thank you, councillor. I've got a question on the, on the, on the corporate credit card too. Yeah. Um, if the if the um 
does the mayor have a corporate credit card? No. Answer, no. I can't work that out, but I think you should. But um, the one that I have here is um, I've worked for a couple of organisations recently in their policies in regard to use of the credit card or booking up accommodation or whatever, that you can charge your meals, et cetera, and drinks, but you can't charge alcohol. And that's not reflected in our credit card policy, and I think it needs to be reflected in it. I'm happy to take that one. If you want. Yeah. The, do you want me to answer the first yeah. one? So the, for the, in relation to that, that's actually handled under our other policy, the entertainment policy, which specifically says that council will not pay for alcohol in any circumstances. And so we've actually managed it through there. It could be, you could be probably mentioned in this policy as well, but basically that's our process. So when we book anything, we actually say that. So we'll say, oh, you know, this person can can have meals or whatever added and they can't, but nothing alcohol or minibar related. So that is part of our process and that's handled under the, the entertainment policy. And, and yeah, just talking about the mayor. So it's um, pretty, um, the, the legal advice on mayors have, or any elected members having credit cards is pretty clear that there's, it, it should not occur in any per, uh, in any circumstance. So we did clear that up a few years ago. We changed our policy and, and removed that. Um, yeah, the, the Auditor General, that's right. The issue being that no single elected member has delegated authority. Um, only the council as a whole have delegated authority. And that's the reason for that issue from the Auditor General. I'll move the recommendation. We have a mover, Councillor Knox has moved the recommendation. Seconded. Now, which one came up first? I did. Sorry? I was first. You did. Seconded, Councillor Simpson. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Item 14.2.3 Propose amendments to the Dog and Cat Management Act to improve cat management. We have a recommendation. Any questions or comments? If I can, through the Mayor. Um, Councillor Cropy Carr has forwarded a number of comments in relation to the responses um, to the dog and cat management changes. Uh, those responses are very consistent, certainly with the responses and the draft responses that have been provided in the council report. So with the council's permission, we will sort of modify some of them uh, to include Councillor Cropy Carr's uh, comments. But as I said, they are consistent with what is there already. Thank you. On that basis, will somebody care to move the recommendation? Councillor Todd, or a question? No, I'll move it. Move, Councillor Todd. Seconded, Councillor Border. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? The guys carry. Thank you. Item 14.3, City Growth. The Ordinary Reports 14.3.1, Connected and Active Communities Project. Take that as read. If Anybody has a question or comment? Councillor Knox. I would like to modify the recommendation to include that a, a quarterly report against the recommendations comes back to Council on a quarterly basis. And the reason I do that is there's a lot of really good stuff in that report and it would be easy to overlook it. And I think that if we get a report every three months against those things, it would be very useful for Council and the community. And it's a very succinct report without having to read through pages and pages. Thank you. So, right, well, we'll treat this as an amendment. The amendment being the original motion plus and will receive a quarterly report. And a quarterly report be written to Council. Yeah. yeah. Needs to be worded a little bit. Yeah. So Councillor Knox has moved that way. Would somebody care to second? Deputy Mayor Pond. I'll put I'll put the motion. Those in favour? <laughs> against? Carried. Thank you. Fourteen point three point two. Community grant. Again, a recommendation there. Anybody has a question or comment before I call for a mover? Councillor Knox? Um, I have a comment. Um, I can't see any financial report included with 
the uh, the item in question. I raise this every time almost that these things come to council, and I've, I've not seen it. If it's in there, somebody please point me to it, but I haven't seen it in there, and that concerns me that we keep raising this and it keeps not happening. Thank you, Councillor. Other than that, I'm in favour of it. I'll take that on notice. I believe it was emailed separately. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's on the it's on the uh, LG hub. While you're doing that, can I ask one more question, please? Certainly, uh, Councillor. Um, if they're unsuccessful in the Sport and Recreation Grant, what then happens to our 5,000? Stays with us as I read it. Mm, correct. Yeah. We're waiting on info. We'll, we'll take, I believe they were collected, but obviously we've had um, Gail um, have a, a medical leave that was unplanned, but I believe it was collected. We'll certainly make sure it's looked at, Councillor. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, with Mr Knox, these are, uh, as this, I reckon, every month or every two months, we get asked the same question, where's the financial report? Certainly make sure it's noted. Uh, therefore, uh, somebody, ca yeah, Councillor Border. Um, moving it if Councillor Knox hasn't already. Right. I'll move it. Councillor Border, move. Councillor Simpson, Second. you're seconding. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. 14.3.3, <laughs> the Wyler Christmas pageant. We have a report, a recommendation, or take it as read. We have a four part recommendation. Councillor Knox. Move the recommendation. Move Councillor Knox. Councillor Todd. Second. You're seconding it. We have the motions <laughs> moved and seconded. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. 14.4, City Infrastructure, we have no reports. 15, Information Decisions Report, 15.1, Council Members, 15.1.1, Mayor's List of Engagements. Anybody has any questions? Otherwise, there should be a recommendation to note the report. <laughs> if no, uh, sorry, Councillor Border. Um, just a big thank you for preparing all those reports and it sounds like it's been a very eventful month or two for you. So um, thank you for sharing the, the detail with us. Not always happy eventful, but <laughs> eventful. <laughs> thank you, Councillor. So we have a recommendation that uh, my activities report be noted. Councillor Todd, you're yes, moving. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Border, yes. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Item 15.1.2, catching up on some uh, reports on conferences, again from the Mayor. A recommendation there if anybody has any questions, otherwise Councillor Knox. Mo moving. Councillor Knox moving. Uh, Councillor Campbell seconding. Thank you for that. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Item 15.2, Corporate Services City Growth, 15.2.1, the monthly information report. Okay, I'll take that as read. But if anybody has any questions or comments, they can certainly be addressed. Ooh. Councillor Simpson. Just, I, I cannot help for some reason, but on page 208, we mentioned the Norton uh, toilets. Are they still having problems with locks? No. 
Right. Hey, thank you. On page 208, they do mention something about Norton Park playground toilets having problems with locks of the doors. We still have problems. Um, no, my understanding is, is that those doors and the locks have now actually been fixed. They have been fixed, but then there was another little problem that had to be fixed. Uh, sorry, Councillor Knox. Just a comment. I'll, I'll have to be receiving these reports. But in, re in regard to the childcare centre, could we also include graphs of attendances, please, for future reports? <laughs> Just so that we can look and see at a glance how we're going with attendances. Childcare centre. Certainly, Councillor. Thank you. And I'm happy to move the recommendation. Right, move, Councillor Knox. Would somebody care to second that? Councillor Border? Seconding? I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Against? Carry. Thank you. <laughs> Item 16, notices of motion. There are nil. Item 17, questions on notice, nil. Item 18, questions without notice. Do we have any questions without notice? Councillor Knox. Sorry about that. Um, we had a report that came out with the agenda on heritage listings for the, the city. And there's no comment on that or no recommend, no motion required for that. Have I missed something? It's a confidential item. Hmm? It's confidential. Oh, item. confidential. Mm -hmm. Okay. Still come in. One in point one point one. Okay. Yeah. I'll bring these items up then. Then. Okay. Um, the other one that I got is the we had a reference at a um, I think it was at a briefing in regard to the jetty piles and the fact that they've been cleaned off marine growth when they shouldn't have been, but nothing as that I've seen has come back to council on that. We were concerned about it at the time. Um, we haven't reported anything back to council on that matter and very happy to uh, pull all of the information together. We have had um, those jetty piles looked at further and we're investigating what the regime of maintenance needs to be on the basis of the um, uh, original maritime recommendations and the agreement that we've got for the maintenance of that jetty. Um, is there anything further, Colin, on that? That's, that's pretty much it. That, that's that's pretty much it. So we were given the information on, on how it was meant to be maintained and we have subcontracted that out. Um, difference of opinions. So we're trying to really do the analysis and scrutinise what we received um, before going forward to respond probably. Happy with that. The other one I wanted to raise was the old fauna park and I had occasion to visit that on um, Saturday afternoon. And there's a lot more vandalism out there than, than I've seen previously. The first shed, as you approach the place, on the right-hand side has been flattened now, and there's quite a bit of broken glass and other debris around there. It's the sort of thing, if you had a decent wind, some of that stuff could blow around. So whether we remove it ourselves or get one of our um, scrap metal merchants in wild to take it away, um, something needs to be done on that, and I guess we need progressively to start looking at the rest of the place as well. I know there's a big cost involved in it, but it's going to be a real problem for us. Thank you, Councillor. Certainly noted. Uh, Councillor Inglis. Uh, more a comment than anything. I think um, we should give great thanks to the work that Tammy or Jeffrey Mayor Pond did over the weekend, putting in a while of show. It was outstanding from all of all the council. You can see the poor buggers aged 15 years. <laughs> no disrespect. Yeah, talking about. Yeah. I just think we should note the fact that it's just, it is the premier community event in Wyler every year, and it's, it's fantastic from all accounts. Yeah. No. Concur. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, yeah. Right, that's um, the end of the yeah, yeah. questions yeah. without notice. Oh, Matt, sorry. I have an answer for Councillor Poppy. Oh, yes, sir. From earlier. Um, so, what we've spent so far is almost entirely relating to the, the works that are going on at the airport that Council passed a resolution for. Um, so, the, the consulting work around um, that the works required um, there. And can I just confirm, we do believe the financials for Still United were supplied to you under separate cover. The reason for that is the confidentiality of the clubs. You should have received an email under separate cover if we could confirm that before we um, address it with administration. But it was certainly collect. I've got a list of what they could have spent and what they spent. It's not an ordered financial statement. 
That's, it, normally but, that's what they require is an audited financial statement. This isn't. Okay, so you did receive it, but you we don't. received that financial statement, but not one, an audited one. Right. It's one they made up. No, I might say made up. They, they, they've got it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any motions without notice? Right. Item twenty: consideration of confidential items. So at this juncture, call for a mover. Now we do have Tony doing a briefing coming online at seven thirty. That's ten minutes away. Do I adjourn the meeting for just 10 minutes or 15? 15. Would somebody care to adjourn the meeting? Move to adjourn the meeting for 15 minutes. <laughs> it's a Christmas tree. <laughs> Which one's my finger on? <laughs> uh, well, in the order that I see them now, moved uh, Deputy Mayor Pond, seconded to Council Campbell. Would you care to uh, a call? For would you care to move the motion to adjourn for 15 minutes? Against? Carried. Thank you. Right, councillor members. Would somebody care to move and second that we re re reconvene our meeting? Move Councillor Border, seconded Councillor Campbell. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? The guys? Carry. Thank you. But I also now have somebody move that we go into confidential, please. Move Councillor Knox, seconded Councillor Todd. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? The guys? Carried. Thank you. Right, with the time at uh, 18 minutes past eight, I'll declare tonight's meeting closed and thank you very much. But a lot of hard decisions we've had to make and still to make. Thank you. <laughs>